Welcome back to another special edition of the Falcons Audible presented by AT&T. This is the initial 53-man roster special edition of the Falcons Audible. And I am so happy to be back with my guys, Dave Archer and DJ Shockley. And I know it might look a little different because I'm not sitting right next to them. Let me tell you guys, we are really close to all of us being <laughs> together. That will be coming very soon. But before we dive into this, I got to say hello to my fellas, Dave, DJ. Dave, why don't you tell us how we're doing, what's going on? And I know you're excited that we're back to some Falcons Are football. you kidding me, Rack? I couldn't be more thrilled to be through preseason. You guys know how I feel about preseason football. So we're on the eve of playing the Eagles here a little bit further down the road, about a week and a half or so. But so excited that we have a new team to talk about. Excited to be able to chop it up with you guys. Looking forward to it. Yeah. And DJ, I know uh, you've taken on some additional responsibilities, but you're still here with us on the podcast. Oh, there's no doubt about it. I could not miss this, even though my man Dan Gad tried to get rid of me. No, I'm just playing. He uh, he, he was <laughs> awesome. He wanted to be back, which was awesome. But, yeah, I'm excited, of course, man. We talk ball with my man Arch. We speak the same language. Rack, you, you're always awesome, man. And uh, to be a part of this is pretty cool and uh, when traded for the world. All right, guys. Well, let's without further ado, let's just dive right into it. As we all know, the Falcons released their initial 53 man roster. And we say initial because, as we all know, a roster is very fluid throughout the course of the season when it comes to injuries, maybe playing time, maybe they find a guy out on the street that's going to help make this roster better. But DJ, let me start right back with you. Give me your initial takes on what you saw when the Falcons released their 53 man roster today. Just kind of a more 30,000 foot view here. So the overall, obviously, we are guys who watch this team all the time. We watched them in camp. We watched them through preseason. And we had a really big, a really good feel of who would be on this ball club. And I think overall, when you look from the top down, you knew the core of this team. You knew exactly what guys would be a part of this team. But there were three or four guys that you saw throughout preseason and said, maybe this guy may have a chance. Maybe this guy can, you know, find a way onto the team. And we know all A.J. McCarron goes down and Felipe Franks has to step in in that second ball game. And you're wondering, okay, Felipe's done a good job. It looks like they have invested a lot into Felipe in his offseason season. Can they find a way to get him on this roster? Do you try to stick him on that fifty on that uh, practice squad and maybe he gets through? I think the Falcons thought that Felipe did enough in the preseason where we can put this guy on the practice squad. There's a chance for him uh, being able to leave. Uh, one guy who I was really looking forward to see where he would end up is Chris Rowland. Chris Rowland ended up being cut. He was a part of that uh, kind of return unit, kind of receiver. Had some good things happen through uh, throughout camp, and he was one of those guys that did not make it and IE comes from Avery Williams, who actually showed up and really did well on the defensive side of the ball here late in the last couple of ball games, as well as in the return game. So those are a couple of guys who, from the mountaintop, I looked down and said, okay, these are guys I want to see where they fell on the 53-man roster, and glad to see we were able to keep Felipe and also Avery Williams take over that return spot. Yeah, and Dave, I know that in the preseason, you don't get a chance to to see all of your starters and even more abbreviated this year with just the three games. And then also, we don't know how the practice squad is going to shake up quite yet. That will be announced after the players end up clearing waivers. But let me go to you. And what was your take when you saw the 53-man roster? Again, kind of from a more general sense. Well, I thought that Arthur Smith said right off the top, he goes, I am going to try to evaluate my players and try to put them in an apples and apples scenario. I don't want a guy competing against this group and then, then the other guys compete. Like, going against Grady Jarrett on the offensive line is a little bit different than going against the third team defensive tackle from Cleveland or whoever. So I want to make sure that they, I can compare these guys and then give them the same opportunities. And I thought he held true to that. We were very vanilla offensively, didn't do a lot of stuff, a few wrinkles defensively just to kind of put some guys in some spots and see if they could create pressure with some of the things that Dean Pease is going to do. But I thought that Arthur Smith held very true to what he wanted to do. I want to give these guys a compete, an opportunity to compete and distinguish themselves and I thought that's what happened. I think when you when you began to look at it, and as I went into this last preseason game, I pretty much had the guys that you were probably trying to decide to, uh, you know, a couple bubble guys here or there, but it looked like that guys stepped forward and distinguished them. Every Williams, uh, Dorian Etheridge, mm -hmm. there were a number of guys that stepped up and took the opportunity. And you guys, we all have heard this, all three of us, hey, make the decision for me. That's what you were told by a coach. Right. Comes in, hey, Rack, make the decision for me. You go out and perform you're going to be part of the 53. And I thought that's what these guys did. 
You know, and I think what a lot of the viewers and people that are listening need to understand, too, is sometimes your last three, four, five guys on the roster, those decisions end up getting made basically more placed on special teams. Like, where is this guy going to help me on kickoff coverage? I need a specific guy on kickoff return. This guy showed me some flashes on a punt block team that maybe he's got a chance of getting there and tipping a punt for us at some point during the season that could really end up changing the, the complexion of a game. So it's not always like, oh, this guy was really good in college and I think he should be on the team. Guys look at this and say, this guy might help us a little bit more on special teams from week one, right when we get off the jump. And that might be the reason why he ends up making a roster. So Dave, I'm going to come right back to you. And again, I want you to give a grade on this 53 man roster. Do your best to try to take a step back from how the guys played in the preseason and what week one looks like. Just give us a grade, the A, B, C, D. You can use some minuses or pluses if you want, <laughs> DJ. You might need to write it down a little bit if that helps you keep it more nice. <laughs> on what you think this roster looks like, Arch. Yeah, that's a really interesting question and evaluation. I think when you begin to look at the 22, if you're going to just talk about the starting 22, I think Atlanta matches up pretty well. I would say their starting 22 is probably a B-plus in my, in my opinion. I do think there are some depth issues on this team, namely at corner, to really young in the secondary. There's some places along the offensive line you're not quite sure about yet. So I guess overall I would probably put – the, the, the grade level will be somewhere in that B minus area, maybe even a C plus right now in my mind. All right, DJ, same question to you. What grade are you giving this 53 man roster as you see it today? You know, I, I think it's kind of in a similar fashion of what Arch talks about. And when you think about a team, obviously the, the first 22, like Arch mentioned, are guys that you could put up versus anybody in this league and say, all right, let's go play ball and see where you lie. But as we know throughout the season, it's a reason why you need 53 guys. It's a reason why you need the 16 guys on practice squad simply because throughout the year you're going to get dinged up. You're going to have guys go down. That's why the emphasis on the preseason was how are these second and third team guys are playing. I know a lot of people made a lot of emphasis on when we played the Miami Dolphins and they had their first team in and we had our second and third team in, but I thought that was a prime opportunity for guys to show, okay, here's some guys who we expect to step up and play if a couple guys go down. So I want to see how those guys fare. Uh, I would say it's more of a B minus. Uh, I think the death part of it is a huge thing. Uh, I think there's still question marks on about rushing the passer. I think that's one thing that the fans will look at and say, okay, who's our guy? We know we got Dante Fowler. We know Tui's coming off the edge. Uh, you know Stephen Means is a guy who can do it. We know Grady can push on the inside. But who are those other guys other than those three or four guys that we can count on on a weekly basis to get you know pressure on the quarterback? So those are question marks that you still ask. Arch talked about the the depth at the corner spot on the outside. You got a lot of talent, but there are a lot of young guys as well. You got a couple guys in Eric Harris and Deron Harmon here on one-year deals that you say, okay, you want those guys to come in and be productive, but you also got some young guys who you're trying to build and develop on. So how quickly can those guys come in and play for you when you need them for this ball club? So the depth part of it is something that's going to be a question mark, something that's going to have to come to fruition as the season goes on. But I think if you lined up the first 22, like Arch just mentioned, I think you feel good about where you lie going into week one. Well, I appreciate your guys' candor, and and you say there's some questions. And, and so we have grades anywhere from, like, the B to the C-plus area. So I guess my my question right back to you, DJ, is if if I'm a Falcons fan – or if I'm just a football fan and I'm looking at this division and I'm hearing two guys that know this organization inside and out, giving them anywhere from a B to a C plus. So let's talk about strengths, DJ. How does the Falcons, this roster, Arthur Smith, Terry Fontenot, how do they make this roster go from a C plus to a B go, to go up to a B plus, an A minus, or maybe even an A? Talk a little bit about the strengths that you see, DJ, with this current roster and how they're going to be able to get this season started on a positive note. Well, Rack, I think that's a great question because I think to talk about strengths for this team, you have to start with at the top where Terry comes from, where Arthur comes from, where their lineage of how they want to run this team and put it together, I think that's where the strength starts. And when you come into this, this season, you're thinking about Arthur Smith coming in here with the identity of being able to run the football. 
Dean Pease comes in here with the identity of they're going to put pressure on opposing teams. And it all comes down to how to use that personnel to your advantage. And I think they have assembled a group of guys on this team that they feel good about when it comes to how they're going to run their particular scheme. You bring in Mike Davis, who is obviously not Derrick Henry, but he's a bruiser back of his own right. He's looking to be the guy for the first time in a long time, and he comes into this season as a healthy guy. You have a Cordell Patterson behind him who – Obviously, in the preseason, we saw didn't get much time, so you expect him to have a huge role on the offensive side of the ball as well. But then you also have the tight end play. You draft the number four overall pick to fit what you do best, which is get the football to the tight end and be creative. There are things that Arthur Smith's going to do throughout the, uh, this season that he didn't show in the preseason that me and Arch have seen out here during camp that a lot of people are going to be excited about in the ways that they get these guys to football. You got a veteran quarterback in his 14th year who doesn't turn the football over. He's a good distributor of the ball, and he's going to have a guy like Calvin Ridley who wants to prove to people that he is the number one guy. Everybody wants to know how he's going to do without Julio Jones. Well, I think we all know in this building that Calvin can be that number one guy, but now I think he's out to prove it. So there are a lot of guys on the offensive side of the ball that are looking to prove themselves to be those guys in this particular system. And then on the defensive side, it's all about blending those different talents together for Dean Pease to have the system that he wants. And let's be honest, wherever he's been, his defenses have been a success. He's going to find a way to get that personnel playing at a high level. And there are guys on that defense who can rush the passer from the linebacker spot a guy who was really productive in the preseason, Michael Walker, who will have a huge part of this defense because of where you can line him up, his athleticism. It's going to be fun to watch how he molds these guys into his scheme. And I think there are a lot of things that I think fans can be excited about when the season comes because of the group of guys that are leading these players into this season, into that particular scheme. Okay, so Arch, I'm just summarizing a little bit of what DJ said. He talked a little bit about the management from the top. Terry Fontenot, Arthur Smith, and then he touched on running back, wide receiver, tight end, and a little bit of defense. So I'm going to put the same question on you. When you look at this roster right now, Arch, I know you've been chomping at the bit to get in here. Where do you see the (laughs) strengths of this current team? Well, the strength to me uh, on the defensive side is the linebackers. The linebackers are the strongest room if you want to throw another room, and I, th- I think the, the safeties in the corners play are in the same room, but if there was a separation, I think you're locked and loaded at safety as well. I think I think Jalen Hawkins and, and Richie Grant, they're the future of the safety position in this team, and they that future might be sooner rather than later. Even though you went and got a couple of veteran guys, I think you're going to see those guys on the field a ton because they're versatile, they can cover, they can tackle, they play special teams. I mean, every special teams tackle in preseason was Richie Grant or Jalen Hawkins. <laughs> no it was unbelievable. Yeah. So they're going to contribute in a myriad of ways. So I think the strength – I'm a little worried at the corner. I'm not gonna worry. I'm not gonna kid you guys. I'm I'm worried about AJ Terrell. I think solid. I think Fabian Moreau has a chance to be a decent player there. I think Isaiah Oliver's settled in at that nickel spot. But I don't know about the rest. Yeah. Of, I mean, you're gonna have to play more than the, than three corners during the season, and I'm not sure. And there's gonna be some developmental process to all of that. But I love the safeties. Love the linebackers. Tight end, you got to love the tight end situation as well. And and don't forget now, a lot of people are talking about, well, who's the third wide receiver? Who's going to be that other guy to make plays with Russell Gage and Ridley? Don't forget now the big dude that the shock was talking about, six foot six, <laughs> two hundred and fifty five pounds that Jeez. runs four four. He's going to slide outside and he's going to play wide receiver. <laughs> and Hayden Hurst is still your tight end, so yeah. you're going to be able to put. And remember. When you do that, and Rack, you can tell us, you got two tight ends on the field. More often than not, if I'm a defense, I'm staying base package. Yeah. So is that a t- is that a corner going to play him? Is it, that means who's playing the guy in the slot? Who's playing on Ridley in the slot? So you can create some matchup issues. I'm excited about that part of it. There's no question. There's some there's some question marks, and we knew that. And they're probably not done, Rack. And I know we may talk about that here in a few minutes. There's still going to be some guys available out there. And you said it, Rack. That. 53rd, 52nd, 51st guy on the on, – don't get comfortable because that's one <laughs> yeah. of those scenarios that the, there may be some other guys floating around there. That's just the real part about it. Yeah, and that's the, the nature of the beast is that there might be some guys that got released today from other teams that the Falcons – feel like could help make their roster better. And so that 53rd, 52nd player might end up getting released in the next 24 to 48 hours in favor of somebody else 
across the league that they feel is going to make them a better team, maybe a more complete team. So, Dave, I'm going to come right back to you. We talked a little bit about the strengths, but to be honest, I think, and this is what coaches do. This is what players have to do. They have to look at the weaknesses and how can we make a weakness a strength or how can we cover up a weakness? So, Dave, you already talked about the corner position. I know you feel like that is a weakness on the team. Is there anything else you expand there or is there another position group or element to this roster that you feel like initially is a weakness for Atlanta? Well, I think that the the first thing that jumps out is how quickly does the offensive line come together? Mm -hmm. I mean, the only – this team has been based on offensive football for the last several years. Since Matt Ryan's been here, it's been an offensive football team. We can count one season where Atlanta's had a top 10 defense here in Atlanta, and that was in 2017. Okay, they've never had – so Matt Ryan has been the guy that had to go score points. Can they go do that? Can they still go score points? I think that that's, that's something – and the only way you're going to be able to do that is to be able to – have solid offensive line play. Matt Ryan's been sacked in the neighborhood of 120 times the last three seasons combined. Yeah. You've got to find a way to keep him off of the ground because I don't know if you've checked, the backup quarterback situation is interesting. Josh <laughs> Rosen looked pretty good the other night in his opportunity. Felipe Franks, I think, has got an unbelievable talent, but he's nowhere near ready to play in the National Football League. you got to keep number two on the field, and that's always been the case, but it might even be more paramount this year, that offensive line, to me, the corner spot, and then have you figured out what you want to do at left guard? It looks like it's Josh Andrews going to start the season there. Jalen Mayfield's had some moments that have been kind of back and forth a little bit. So, to me, that has to be solidified because you've got to be able to go score some points. DJ, are there any weaknesses that you feel are different than Arch, or would you back up anything that you've heard him say so far? No, I I love the fact because offensive line is – probably the biggest storyline that we've talked about for the last three, four years. And Arch mentioned the number of times Matt's been hit and obviously keeping the franchise guy up and healthy. And when he is, we know exactly what his offense can look like. So I, I totally agree uh, with Arch talks about there. The one thing that, uh, you know, I, I don't, I don't mind bringing up is the running back spot. We know Mike Davis, uh, Cordell Patterson has always been kind of a guy who teams have used in the gadgets you know, space. I mean, we've seen him on reverses. We've seen him coming in, have two or three carries. How much does Cordell actually carry the football? How much do we give Mike Davis opportunity to have that load? Is he coming here and have 300 carries like we had when Mike Turner first got here? I mean, is he going to be that guy for you? Because we understand in this Arthur Smith style of offense, the play action game is critical. We know you have to be able to run the football. And if Mike Davis is a guy who comes in and he plays that role and does it well, then okay, everything's great. But what if there comes a time where Mike Davis is dinged up a little bit? And now it's Quadri Allison, your guy. We've seen him sparingly through the last few years. Can he handle that load? And I think a lot of people are expecting him to be that guy, but time will only tell. So if that running back position comes in and fulfills the void and plays to the level that Arthur Smith needs in this offense, then, hey, we have a positive. We have a positive. But if it doesn't, here's a glaring weakness right out the gate where here we go again where – we're a team that depends on Matt Ryan to throw the football 40 times a game, and I don't think that's what this this offense wants to be. Well, and, and, and I know guys were chomping at the bit to really get into X's and O's and talk about football because as soon as you guys start talking about <laughs> offensive line, it makes me want to start talking about the actual game, and I'm trying to keep this as a <laughs> roster announcement episode here. But – You guys both pointed to like balance and you pointed to offensive line. And trust me, those offensive linemen, these coaches coming onto this staff, they know the numbers. They know how much Matt Ryan has been under pressure. And if they're going to be able to execute Arthur Smith's style of offense, they've got to have balance, which starts on the offensive line. So all of those guys have got to accept the challenge. They've got to work harder. They've got to coach harder. And they've got to execute once they start playing regular season games against Philadelphia once that comes around. Go ahead, DJ. And one thing to add to it, that I think is a strength, and we talk about the offensive line so much, but there's so many guys I think on his roster arts that you could, uh, uh, I think you agree is there are a lot of guys who are versatile. They can play multiple roles, can do multiple things. We saw in the preseason, we saw Jalen Mayfield play guard for a half, go out and play tackle. You seen Dalman play play center, see him play guard. There are a lot of things that on this offensive line, as well as in the secondary where guys can play multiple spots that brings the versatility part into it. That's going to help this team as well. So if that's the case going forward, you like that idea of having guys who can do multiple things because that helps you. 
but we'll see if that's really uh, something that can help you. Yeah, I, th I think that you make a good point, Shock. But for me as a fan – uh, jack of all trades is great master of none i'm not looking for that at all i want guys that are going to lock down positions yeah. right yeah. so i love the fact that you yeah. got guys are versatile one of the guys they kept in the secondary tj green played safety played in safety. college played safety the first two weeks in camp they moved him to corner yeah. and he showed really well in the in the game this last weekend made two plays on fade route he's six foot three 225 pounds playing corner yeah but he also has the versatility. If you get dinged up, he can slide inside and play safety. Yeah. And, oh, by the way, he's going to be all your, all your special teams. I like an athlete at 6'3", 220 that can run up and down the field. So that versatility, I love that. But he's in a support role. Yeah. I don't need that when I got a starter. <laughs> yeah. I want a guy that's locked that position down. That's yeah. what I'm looking for. All right, guys. So we've talked a lot about different position groups, strengths and weaknesses. And I just want to pose this question back to you and have you guys answer it. Arch, I'm going to start back with you is the Falcons will win in 2021 if dot, dot, dot. And I'm just going to let you go with wherever you want on this one. But know that we're basically talking about a roster here, but they're going to win in 2021 if. Wow, that's it's a, it's a really interesting question, and you could go a lot of different ways with it, couldn't you? I, I'm going to try to stay true to what I've been talking about here. I think Pease and the defensive side are going to create some issues. I think they're also going to have some issues from time to time, trying to fit a lot of the concepts. I'm going to go directly back to if you can run it with some success, like Shock was talking about, and it's the backs, but it's the offensive line. If you can create a line of scrimmage on the other team's side of the line of scrimmage, more often than not, I'm talking about 70, 65, 70% of the time, I'm winning the line of scrimmage. Because mm -hmm. you're not going to win it every time. It doesn't happen. But if you can, you can dictate up front and be able to get the play caller, Arthur Smith, in second and six, third and four, third and three, and you live in that zone, then I think Atlanta could be a playoff team. But if they don't do that, now all of a sudden Ryan's having to drop. You mentioned 40-plus times a game. Uh, is he going to be able to make enough plays? And then you put a lot of stress on not converting on third down. And if you don't win the third down battle, Rack, you guys know – now my defense is back on the field, and I give an, a, one of these talented offenses that I'm going to see. I'm going to get Tom Brady in week mm. two. I'm going to give him two or more three, two or three more series against my defense. I'd prefer not to do that. I want to be able to control the football, control the line of scrimmage. Yeah, staying on schedule sounds yeah. like what I'm reading in between the lines there, Arch. And again, a lot of that goes back to the offensive line. We may, Maybe the Falcons don't have a Derrick Henry. We don't know until the season starts. But I know that Derrick Henry also had an offensive line in front of him mm -hmm. that helped him have so much success and keep that Tennessee Titans offense on schedule with the chains and leaving Arthur Smith as a play caller in some very favorable situations. So, DJ, same question to you. The Falcons win in 2021 <laughs> Rack, uh, I got two things, and the first part of it is it deals with developing our young talent. And I think about young talent comes along sooner than we expect. Art mentioned earlier about the Richie Grant and Jalen Hawkins, those guys coming on and being some roles on the defense that we can use and not be a disadvantage when they're on the field, be guys that people go after. If those guys can develop early, even on both sides of the ball, if you can get something from your third or fourth receiver, whether it's OZ or whether it's uh, Christian Blake, some of those guys appear in these ball games where you're going to get a lot of one-on-one -on -one matchups. If you can win those, you got a chance to be good because you know your stars are going to come up and play. You know they're going to show up and play. But some of these younger guys in these other roles show up and be some contributors I think you got a chance to do a really uh, do some really good things the second part of it is it's your phase that you love rack is that third phase that people forget about is special team if you can get something out of your special team if you can get some positive yardage in the return game if you can do some really good things pinning guys deep when you punt the football and you got make the team go 80 90 yards to score touchdowns if you can be efficient in that third phase and not give up things in that third phase I think you got a really good chance of doing some good things so those are two things that I think about when I say okay can this team be a little bit better than what people are expecting is young secondary young talent become better sooner rather than later and then you get something really significant from that third phase of the game where it's contributing to you and not hurting you such a great point rack it, when, when you start talking about the special teams 
because you can cover up a lot of warts if you can make a plays on special teams, right? Mm-hmm. If I can get an, a first down or two on a kick return, meaning I get a 10 or 12, 15, 20-yard return, can I create uh, negative plays on the kick, kick coverage units where I, I tackle a guy inside the 20-yard line? That was something that you guys did such a great job of in special teams. Get ready now. Avery Williams, who's going to handle the kicks, he had nine kick returns for touchdowns in college. He shows a knack for it. I've got to go back to one of your guys back in the Alan Rossum, who had Rossi. a little bit of a, a swagger about him back there, and you you could see he was frothing at the mouth. Kick the ball to me. Kick. That's how what I, I see from Avery Williams. He's got a knack for making some stuff happen. Get ready. It's going to happen, Falcon fans. This kid's going to take one back. Yeah. Or a couple. Yeah, I love what you guys talked about. Um, you know, DJ, I've, I've loved you regardless, but now that you talked about special <laughs> teams in a podcast of the season, you've now just won another special place right here. That right there. No doubt. All right, guys, before we wrap up this podcast, I do want to make one mention of some roster announcements from around the league as they start to come out a little bit, and there haven't been too many surprises. Maybe the biggest one that probably hit everybody's smartphone earlier this morning <laughs> was the release in of Cam Newton in New England. Maybe not a surprise because of the draft pick of Mac Jones, but DJ, let me just start with you. Is it something that you saw coming with Cam Newton? Did you see him in New England long-term or was the writing on the wall once Mac Jones' name was announced? Uh, I'll be honest. I did not see this coming. I would be lying if I sit here and say, yeah, I thought Mac Jones would be the guy that cut Cam Newton and they'll move on. No, I thought Cam would actually start the season. Just like everybody else, I thought he would be a big part of what they do. Uh, I thought he did really well in the preseason. I thought he played, you know, better than he did last year. I thought he got a whole offseason to work on uh, what they like in that system. And I thought he was moving in the right direction. Yeah, you, you drafted a guy 15 overall. Obviously, they like him. But I thought you did enough to hold him off. But obviously, not so. And the release of Cam Newton uh, is something that you didn't see coming. But you also can understand it from a wide angle view of what they look at and what they like in Mac Jones. And me and Archer was talking about this before we came on. And there was three days last week where he missed practice. In those three days he missed practice, I guarantee you Mac Jones threw over three, four hundred passes in that game. And they obviously saw something that they like in those three practices that said, okay, this is what it would look like if there was not a Cam Newton part of this process and he came in ready he came in I mean this is a guy that you know graduated two and a half years you know he's smart but he played well in the preseason and the one thing that I heard about Mac Jones is and for a quarterback this is this is rare but this is also something that if you can do this it makes you special he when he makes one error he doesn't make it again and I know that's one thing that from that position you make one mistake but you don't make it again. You move on. You're able to grow. That's a big part of the development process. And obviously they saw enough in Mac Jones to say that we don't need Cam Newton on this team right now to be our guy. Same thing for you, Arch. Do you feel like New England's in good hands with Mac Jones? Well, I think it's it's what they wanted to be at some point. So when do you make that decision? I think that there's some more underlying things going on here. I don't necessarily think that that Cam and Bill Belichick were necessarily on the same page based on some of the comments that were coming out of there over the last week, missing some time in practice. There was a lot of smoothing the water over. And if you're having to do that, then there's an issue, certainly. Remember this, too, and you and I both played the position, Shock. There's a mentality it takes to be a backup quarterback or a nurturer. Yeah. And that's the role Cam Newton was in. Cam was the starter, we thought. But he was supposed to be a nurture. He's going to nurture this guy, bring this guy along. He's not interested in no. doing any of that. No. And and it's no. not just Cam yeah. Newton. Brett Favre didn't want to have yeah. anything to do with Aaron Rodgers <laughs> no either. Doubt. Okay, so no, no. there's certain guys that can go gracefully from being the guy to now being the nurturer and the backup guy. And there's yeah. some guys that can't. Cam thinks he's a former MVP of this league, and he still thinks he can run the show. No doubt. And that doesn't mean I'm going to wrap my arm around the young guy and help bring him along. And I think that's part of it. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Arch. I mean, it, is it surprising? I get where you're, where you're going with it, Shock, a little bit, just because you think maybe they would go one year with Cam Newton to let Mac Jones get up to speed. But when I think about personalities and I think about the Patriots organization, I just didn't see that lasting very long at <laughs> yeah. all. To me, Cam yeah. Newton's personality does not fit into New, New England, and they just decided that it wasn't going to be well, longer well, right, than when a you, year. When you're winning games, the dancing and all that kind of stuff, that's that's okay. But 
when you're not effective <laughs> and you ain't doing what you're supposed to, people can do without it. I know that. Yeah, and as we know, there are some extremely large shoes to fill at that position in New England. So we'll see if Mac Jones has got it in him. Only time will tell, and we'll have a, a first glimpse of that here in a couple of weeks. Guys, I think that's going to be our time. Uh, we're getting to the end here, so I just wanted to to say it's great to see y'all again. You too, man. Uh, you guys are looking you, bro. fabulous. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Know, Let's see if right? we can do it in great. person uh, next. Can we do it in person next time? <laughs> I know. No, we're trying to make it happen, and it's going to happen. Because I'm, uh, I'm beginning to think this is more of a Muppet show. I don't even know if you're real or not anymore. Are you just a guy? Is there a guy with work uh, in the mouth? Yeah. And... Like this? I'm real. Okay, I'm okay. Real. Well, we'll see Pull you next the strings. time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, guys, I appreciate the, uh, the honesty, the insight, uh, the, uh, the football knowledge, and um, – It'll be fun if we can go back in eight weeks, maybe 12 weeks, and kind of revisit some of the comments that we made here to see yeah. if the Falcon season has been successful, if it's some of the things that you guys outlined uh, here today. So uh, that's going to wrap it up for the Falcons Audible, presented by AT&T, a special edition of the initial Falcons 53-man roster. As we know, this roster is going to change over quite a few times throughout the course of the season. I'm Derek Rackley. I'm with Dave Archer and DJ Shockley. We're going to sign off for now, but we will be back very shortly, very soon for another episode of the Falcons Audible presented by AT&T. Thanks so much, everybody. Take care. You're listening to Falcons Audible presented by AT&T.